Hey everyone, good evening. It's me again. I just returned home from New Orleans where Urology Advanced Coding and Reimbursement Seminar was held over the weekend. And through the course, there were a ton of questions. One of the questions was about productivity. How do I convert patients from the office to a procedure such as the Urolift system? And tonight I'm very, very honored to have Stephanie Draws She's in the Midwest and works with a urologist. She's a nurse practitioner who's very well versed in converting patients from medical therapy or in office to the procedure so we can cure the patient. BPH is such a big problem. The total addressable market is about 40 million just in the US. And currently about 11 to 12 million men are under treatment of some sort, largely medical therapy there are much better ways to cure them, to treat them and cure them of the problem instead of just putting a Band-Aid, which is what medications are. So thank you, Stephanie, for doing this on a fine Sunday evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this because, as you know, my background primarily is oncology and hematology for 15 years. I've only been in urology for about it's been about a year. And so I, I am like the, the beginner of urology. And so, you know, if I can do this, you guys can do this. It's really a, a, t a testament to show that, that you really don't need, you really don't need a, a 20 years of practice in urology to make this happen for your office. Okay. So I know you work with Dr. Lyon and he's one of your docs. Mm-hmm. You started your practice or your office started doing your lifts. How long ago? We've been doing them for roughly two, three years, more, like regularly. Uh, when I had come into the office, they were doing roughly one, averaging one and a quarter per month. Okay. So roughly one a month. Um, and one and Eurolift was, procedure per month. Correct. Got it. Correct. And it was, there was no cut and dry. When, when I came on, I, I was hired as a nurse, pract nurse practitioner, but also to help with marketing and kind of productivity because I came from a super productive business-oriented oncology practice. And so I had a lot of that knowledge. And when I came on, there was just like no clear cut, cut way how people were getting from procedure or from office to procedure. And so it really was beneficial for Eurolift to do these, to do these preceptorships because when I went and saw how the offices worked and how it was just like clockwork, I'm like, wow, there's just some really simple things that you need to do in the office. And especially for me, like having no urology background, I'm like, they're really simple. And, and I think that uh, the biggest thing that, that I hear from other urology practices is, well, I don't have the patience. <laughs> Like, that, oh my god! That is so silly. You no, have tons of patients. Yeah, let, let, let's step back a little bit. So you've been let's you've been doing this for about two to three years. You were lift, and then you initially were doing about one and a quarter per month in your office, Correct. and then you joined the practice, having worked mm -hmm. at a super efficient oncology practice before, and you, and Mark or Doctor Lyon uh, brought you in knowing that you not only can you work as a nurse practitioner, but you also have a lot of good insight into how to optimize. So the key here is workflow, mm -hmm. optimize the workflow, yes. having a set protocol on how to, Absolutely. how to move a patient through the treatment paradigm and realizing that there are more patients in the typical urologist office than most likely what he or she can handle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think it's super important that in that process of, de of creating that workflow, your staff needs to know why it's important for them to be handing out the IPSS form, why it's important to get that, that patient scheduled for that trust system in a timely manner, why it's important for them to get to the procedure in a timely manner. It, it's really important because when we first initiated changes in the workflow to get patients from office to procedure, there was a lot of pushback from the office staff because it, it is a change. It, it's not it's not a huge change, but it is a change. And, it, and the IPSS form can kind of be cumbersome sometimes when you're like, patients don't understand it. They don't fill it out. I didn't bring my reading glasses and now you need to have the MA help them out. So there, there was kind of a pushback, I would say for a good three months. And then I was like, 
you know what, maybe I just need to have a sit down with the staff and be like, okay, this is why it's important. This is why we need to do it. And this is why we need to get patients scheduled this way. And then once we all kind of were on board, it was like, it was, it was super simple. Okay. Let me, let me uh, share something. Uh, the, the last thing at the uh, urology advanced coding reimbursement seminar uh, that uh, Mark Painter said was that we, we shared a lot of information and tips and tricks on coding, billing, reimbursement, and how to run your practice better. And Mark, at the very, very, very end of the meeting said, none of this comes easily, and it is not overnight. Also, he said, having a plan is really, really important. And you kind of said that not just a plan, but explaining to the staff why certain things are important is also key to success. So let's, let's go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. What did you, how, how was your practice handling BPH patients? Was there a plan? Was there a protocol? Was there a workflow or anything in the past? There really wasn't. It was, oh, you're on meds. Okay. You're, you're doing okay on meds. you you seem to be doing fair. Maybe you haven't had a lot of changes from, you know, last visit. And so we just continue. Wait, wait, wait. Meds. Okay. So how was that assessed? How was you're doing yeah. okay assessed? Like just yeah, did so you, that did was you, just on like a just on like a face to face encounter. No, 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 no. Did did you ask did the doctors just simply ask the patient how are you doing and that's it? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, we we know that there there's there's so much there's so many holes in just asking the patient if he or she is doing okay. I have always gotten an IPSS from every single BPH patient. And not only that, if they are on medical therapy, I ask them, how are they tolerating the medication? Not, not just how are you doing with the medication? Right. I specifically ask, are you experiencing any side effects? And right. if they don't know what the potential side effects are, I remind them, or if they come in from another doctor's office already on medication, I will tell them, the most common side effects are nasal congestion, retrograde ejaculation. I don't say retrograde ejaculation. I say less semen coming out when you orgasm. But I specifically address the side effects, not just the I get not don't only do I get the IPSS. I also ask them, are they having any side effects? And I know certain. Uh, I, mean, I know Neotract will provide IPSS pamphlets or questionnaires right. that, that at the very bottom it asks mm -hmm. a specific specific, nah, specific question. What what is that question? Are you using that hand handout? Oh yes. Now and now we've we've totally changed the practice that every patient gets an IPSS every single time they walk in the door if they are over the age of forty. Every single male gets a page, gets gets one of those forms. Isn't it amazing the, how many men it, have LUTs? It, it's it's unreal to think that you don't have enough patients in your practice. Oh yeah, <laughs> that, I, I, I mean, you, you and I, I, mean, I, you and I both know that is just not true. No, it's not true, and 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 yet, with how many education uh, meetings and seminars and things that I've gone to, the number one question from these doctors is, well, how do I get more patients? That how how do I get more BPH patients? And I'm thinking. Every one of your male patients is a freaking BPH patient. I know. It, it, not, 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 it's not, they, they say, uh, they ask me, well, I don't have BP, I don't have the BPH patients in my practice, or I can't find five cases right, right. in my practice. That is right. the biggest farce in my mind. Yeah. Most yeah. urology practices, unless you're a super niche that does nothing but, but fertil infertility, or if you are just a female urology right. and that's all you do or right. just robotic surgery yeah th th then those guys or gals may be different but for most urologists in the u.s you have more than enough bph patients in your existing practice it's just simply exactly. asking the right questions and like you said getting the ipss to screen everybody and then well and i feel like the ipss really is is kind of that that's that opening conversation Absolutely. To, to kind of lead you to, okay, well, you said you're doing okay with urination, but you have an IPSS form of 30. <laughs> like, let's talk about why, why you're not doing okay. And I, I think there's just the stigma that men typically just don't complain or they've learned to live with it, or they're afraid of what's going to, what's going to happen if they admit to something. And, and so, 
um, it really is just kind of like that opening question, like that opening conversation starter to just get patients talking about it. And the reason I think it's important that we, we give one every single time. And a lot of times I'll overhear the girls at the front desk and the patients are like, Oh, I was just here two months ago. I already filled that out. And I'm like, okay, but we need that every single time you come. So we can kind of look at your trend and how things have changed and progressed and, or improved if you've had a procedure. And, and so it, it really just kind of allows that conversation to happen so freely because the patients have already kind of put it out there with what they're experiencing. Yeah, I completely agree. And the practices that are saying that they don't have enough EPH patients, well, they're they're simply not using, probably not using the questionnaire, the yeah. IPSS yeah. questionnaire. It's a validated questionnaire. So mm -hmm. uh, un unless the patient is being un untruthful in answering, <laughs> Uh, over yeah. time, it should be able to track any changes if you started or stopped medical therapy or after treatment, the, the, the symptom scores should change depending on what treatment was prescribed or implemented in the past. Right, right. Are you using the paper IPSS? So we are. We are using the the one that NeoTrack provides. Okay. Um, and, and we're just trying to stay with the consistent with the same one. Of course. Um, we have we have thought about, you know, doing some things with the iPads and that kind of thing while patients are in the waiting waiting room. Uh, we just haven't gotten to that point yet. Okay. So some practices that are that have some sort of a, a tablet or maybe uh, I don't even know if Freesia integrates with with or has an IPSS that integrates with EHRs. I, I, I don't know. But um, so there's paper, there's a tablet or electronic format, or in my practice, we have the patients answer those, the IPSS in the office. And what we did was we took one, we're, we're kind of green, so we're, we want to try to be green. So we took one piece of paper, created the IPSS, and we laminated it. So oh, patients, okay, sim that's a good idea. patients simply fill it out with an erasable marker. And at the end of the visit, once they leave, the medical assistant simply erases the uh, the erasable piece of document. So there are no privacy issues and we don't even have the patients fill out the name because there's only one patient in the room and filling that out. So we, we know that it's the, that is the results or answer from that particular patient. So that's, that's one way, that's another way to do it. Yeah. I like but I, that idea. But I think that the key idea. is to, to actually have your staff implement and ask the questions instead of assuming. Exactly. Because, you know, I think about if I go to the doctor's office and somebody asks me, oh, well, how are you doing? Well, that's really a loaded question. And if I'm going to an endocrinologist and they're asking me, well, how am I doing? I mean, that, you, do you really want to know how my GI symptoms are? Or do you want to know how my thyroid symptoms are? And so it, it's, it's kind of like the same thing. And, and so sometimes I think we have to like take down our brain a notch and be like, okay, these are layman's, you know, right. coming into the office. Exactly. And sometimes they don't even remember why they're coming in to see you. And so you you really just need to kind of handhold. And, and that IPSS form is such a simple way to just get everybody, everybody on track and have those conversations. And really and truly, that that's how you're going to get your patients to the trust system and then to to the procedure. You know, it's not like oh, you're going to hand them a, a pamphlet on on Eurolift and BPH and, and be like, well, I no. I felt your uh, prostate and it's big, and so I think no. you should have this done. No, it's like whoa, patients need to see for themselves that yeah, I am you know getting up at night and 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 it and you really need to incorporate the pathophysiology of BPH and the anatomy and really just going over educating these patients. And it kind of just all ties together. It just makes I, it so seamless. I have some suggestions on, on that. But first of all, let's go back to, to the, the IPSS. Now, your staff or your office was not using IPSS before. Did you? How did you introduce that into the workflow? Did you just have the medical assistants say, you, so, you told the medical assistants, this is just the way it is now, we, we need to collect these? And when are the patients filling those out? So from a workflow perspective, walk us through that. Right. So they were using IPSS before I, when I came on, um, but it was like almost like they cherry picked who was going to fill out inconsistently. the form. Very inconsistent. Got it. Got it. And um, and and so it's very hard to determine how your patient's doing on meds or or what have you if you're not having them fill out the form. And and some of the kickback was, oh well, they had a terp in in 2005. I'm like, 
Okay. They could <laughs> in, in, in the interim they could have developed a post TURP bladder neck contracture. They could have had a bulbar urethral stricture or or, or regrowth right. of prostate. So you don't really know. Right. And 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 so we we decided that we can't make those decisions for the patient. They have to fill that form out. And so we actually now utilize the clipboard. And so whenever the patient checks in, they automatically get handed the clipboard while they're in the waiting room. Got it. And they fill that form out. And it takes, you know, one, two minutes. That's it. And so that way that by the time that they get called back, the form's been filled out or they're filling it out while they're in the in the room. They've been moved into the room. And then, boom, it's ready for you to go. You're not having to waste time, you know, going through it with the patient. Now, there are patients that you do need to help with that form. I mean, I have patients that are they're self-cathing and their IPSS is like a two. I'm like, you're really happy and pleased with self-catheterizing. Wow. So there are there are some patients that you do have to help with it, but but it really doesn't take much time out of your day to, to just have those patients fill that form and, out. And that's that is that is why it is important to actually ask the question, the IPSS score, because a lot men are stoic. We we will under report <laughs> our symptoms. Yeah, even though we're getting up three times a night and we dribble on our shoes when we pee, when we pee, we'll, we'll be like, oh, that's okay. The other thing is BPH is a slow progressive problem. So the symptoms com come on very insidiously. Guys will come in with AUA symptom score of 23, 25, 30, and mm -hmm. they're fine. They'll tell you they're fine. Their bother score is low because they're used to voiding that way. And I actually capture their Euroflow and PVR and their their Euroflow will demonstrate an obstructive voiding pattern. So like the you know the typical sawtooth right. flow pattern and they're saying, "Oh yeah, no, I'm fine. I'm delighted with the way I'm voiding." <laughs> so there's yeah. some discrepancy yeah. there. Yeah. And, and and so I mean and I mean it to, personally I think that sometimes the IPSS form the patients that are bothered the most are the patients with the lower scores sometimes because yes. it, the, those are the guys that maybe only have a 30 or 35 gram prostate and they're like, oh, my I, my IPSS might only be a seven or an eight, but man, I'm really, I'm really feeling terrible about this. Yeah. And, and so that was a huge change for our practice was treating patients with, with, with BPH, but with smaller, smaller prostates. Uh, because the Eurolift is so terrific for that because you, you can just tuck some of that tissue out of the way and boom, those guys are like feeling like a million bucks. Well, during uh, medical school, they, they tell us that uh, if you get a good enough history, the patients will tell you 90% of the time their diagnosis. When it comes to IPSS, you brought up a great example how the bother score could be high, but then their IPSS is only 7 but the mm -hmm. good thing about IPS is that now you can look in detail what part of the seven is causing you to have such difficulties. Right. Why are you bothered? Is it the nocturia? Is it the frequency? Is it the urgency? Or is it the intermittency or the weak flow? So now you have a way to very quickly at a glance look at the IPSS because you can, you know, depending on where they circle, you can tell what is the which ones yeah. are high and then concentrate on that and ask quick probing questions, okay, what bothers you the most? You know, or you can say, well, your score is so low, but what's bothering you really? What what part of this is really bothering you? And then you can treat that problem. It could it could be it could be something other than BPH. It could be just overactive bladder. Exactly. And I think once once we've had that conversation about, you know, the the lower urinary tract symptoms, then just using a model to to just really simply go through how that prostate is causing that bladder to work harder, work, you know, be stronger, and how those symptoms are occurring. Because a lot of times they're like, no, I, I'm peeing fine. I'm not having a problem peeing. You know, I, I'm peeing okay. I'm peeing all the time. I'm peeing, you know, every hour. Well, yeah, of course you are because you're, <laughs> you're they just don't understand. Right. And so that that is huge for them to see that model and be like, okay, now, now I'm putting all the pieces together. And now I understand why I need to have the trust system and, and why I need to consider having an intervention. Because um, I think if you're just throwing them right into saying, oh, well, I think this, you need a procedure or you need surgery, it's like, okay. <laughs> You know, they have to understand why. And, and so you it really is so simple. And, and one thing that's really been effective for our practice is utilization of scanning in the IPSS form and showing that to the patient at their visits. So a lot of times, uh, if we can fast their, their forward. Past, their past forms. 
Mm-hmm. Got it. Yeah. Got it. I yeah, captured. So I like, actually captured that in my、uh, as part of my history of present illness. So I captured that, and I'm able to relate to the patient. Hey, did you remember what your score was last time or pre Eurolift? Right, Do you remember what、right. your score was? And I'll say it was twenty eight. And now you're back in the office. Your score is only six. Exactly. That's huge for them too to see on paper. Like, of course, everybody likes to see those kind of Im- improvement and results. They like to see factual stuff, you know, like tangible things. And so、um, that's huge because for patients to be like, "Wow, yeah, I was a thirty," or, or you know, maybe they come in after the year lift and they're like, "Oh, my IPSS is still a ten." And I'm like, "Yeah, but you remember you were a thirty-five before your year lift?" <laughs>、yeah. Like, this did work, you know. And so、uh, it, it, the IPSS is so good, not just for getting patients to trust the stone procedure, but really for For for、um, you know showing patients that this was effective for you, or this is where you're at now, and this is where you were last year, and and so it's it's so it's such a it's such a good tool for for a urology practice. And I would say if if you're not using it with every single male patient over forty, you're really doing yourself a disservice. Doing the patients a disservice, in my opinion,、mm-hmm. having treated、yes. all these、yes. guys who ignore their problems, and if you if The PCPs don't. They 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 ask that question. Are you doing okay? Oh, okay. We'll just keep going with your medication. But、yeah. I think as specialists, as urologists, we need to do a much better job than that. And I think IPSs is is、mm-hmm. the the least that we should be doing. Absolutely. Okay. So we are streaming this live on Facebook, and、uh, I'm gonna read.、Uh, Sarah Beth says yes、uh, regarding what we discussed, and Karen. Uh, Dr. Tart and、uh, Dr. Tart says agreed.、Um, Sarah says, "Are you giving your forms at the front window when they check in, or when they get to the exam room?" And it sounds like you're giving at them the at the front desk.、Mm-hmm. I will tell you what we do here. So for, let's just say, as for instance, it's a B, brand new BPH patient who comes into the office. I actually look in my practice management software to look at what the presenting complaint is. Most of the time, my staff already knows that when a guy is coming in with urinary difficulties or BPH. Sometimes, you know, now now that I've been doing urolifts for so long and my name is out there in the community that I do, I'm very proficient in urolifts. A lot of guys, the presenting complaint is urinary difficulties. Discuss urolift. So when those patients come in or register or call to make an appointment with that primary complaint. We attach in our prime in our practice management software, URF and PVR. So when the patient comes in, we we will telegraph to them. Okay, before you come in, you need to come in with a full bladder. And as soon as they arrive, we have them go through a Euroflow. If they come in with a full bladder and they really need to go, they will go through the Euroflow first and then fill out any paperwork and just and, and complete the logistics of of checking in the patient. So we we take care of the patient first before we deal with that paperwork. Then, my MA will intake the patient, vitals, labs, the the past history and all that stuff, review systems, and、um, then the patient is brought into the exam room. That is where the patient is handed the IPSS in my practice. So to answer、uh, Sarah, sorry, I'm gonna screw up your name, Shellen Shellengerhout.、Uh, so、uh, Stephanie. Gives her patients the IPSS in the in the in the check-in area, whereas I give it in the exam room. It doesn't matter where you give it, as long as you actually provide or ask for that information. You can integrate it however you want in your practice, whatever works in your workflow. And Sarah Beth is Sarah Beth says it's all about how you talk to the patients. She joined a new practice in August, and she's doing at least ten a month, ten euro less a month. Um, her partner maybe three. I think it is how you talk to your patients. So, what do you think about that, Steph? It a hundred percent. If your patients are not educated enough about the basics of BPH, and that even though they that that they are peeing okay, they are never gonna get to a procedure ever. They're just it's just never gonna happen. And so it's so simple to just. Utilize that IPSS form as a tool to have that conversation, have that simple anatomy discussion with the patients, and then scheduling them for trust to stow or however your practice gets them to that next step. Now, for us, 
that meant some big, big changes because we, we really didn't, the, the small amount of patients that we were getting to trust the stoat was kind of like, okay, well, it confirmed that you have a big prostate and this is what we recommend. But we, it was never like concealing, like sealing the deal, so to speak, and getting them scheduled for a procedure. It was kind of like a, eh, you know, it's you like could a do soft, this. It's like a, so, it's like a soft commitment. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. So we, re we really revamped things. And now it's, we have that conversation, we get the patient to trust the stow on the same day as their trust the stow. We have a sit down with them. We tell them to bring their significant other or family, family member. We show them the Eurolift video. We go through the Eurolift process and they leave with an appointment for the procedure. That is that is key because you can do all of the things. You can get the patients to the trust the stow. You can do the IPSS forms. You can have the talk about BPH. But if you're not, if your patients are not leaving with an appointment or at least being educated about why you think they should have a Eurolift or, you know, whatever procedure you're choosing for them, they're going to get lost in the shuffle. You mentioned education multiple times. And uh, I noticed that you let the patient see the open that there's a video player that neotrack provides it's called meet mike and as soon as you open it it'll play a three four five minute video so that patients can see talks about the pathophysiology of bph and the treatment options and some of the benefits of Eurolift and potential side effects etc you give it to the patients after you've done the cystoscopy and transrectal ultrasound whereas yeah. i give it actually my medical assistants give the patient. So this is what happens. So patients undergo a Euroflow. My MA brings the patient, obtains updates, past history, review systems, rooms the patient the, and, and provides the patient the IPSS document so the patient can fill it out. And also she will ask the patient, have you met Mike? This is literally what my medical assistant Nikki says to the patient. Have you met Mike? A lot of the patients will have seen the video on YouTube or online somewhere on Eurolift's website. So they will say, oh yeah, I already saw the video. But most of the time, she'll just give it to the patient and she'll say, Dr. Lin would like to like you to watch this video. Uh, it may or may not pertain to you because they may not have EPH. But at least, like you said, education. Now the patients understand one of the potential causes of his urinary difficulties, which is BPH. Yeah, we, we, we try not to, you know, every practice is different. And absolutely that, that's what's so great is that no matter how you use the tools, as long as you're using them, uh, that that's really what's most important for us. Um, sometimes I feel like the, those new patients can be a little bit overwhelmed and just hearing that they have to have all these different things to, uh, done, preoperative testing, so to speak. Um, we do try to save that that educational piece uh, of as far as like the procedure for more on the trust Sisto day. But we are doing a lot of an anatomical education uh, during that first initial visit. And, and I do it with every patient, every visit, because there have been a lot of patients that have been resistant to procedures. And it, it, it's kind of like a TV commercial, right? You see, you see the Budweiser commercial with the, with the horses and the Clydesdales. And it's like, you know, you've seen that so many times you can almost predict what's, what's going to come next. And it's just like, it's just like being in a doctor's office. If you're, if you're having that conversation, talking about it, sometimes they, they say that the average person needs to see something 10 times before they'll buy it. Um, it's, it's kind of the same, same thing with medic, medic, uh, medical field, you know, patients have to see it, they have to be exposed to it, they have to understand it before they're really going to buy into it. Okay. And, and so that you can never talk about these things enough. And I think that's really key is you, you really just can't, you can't utilize the IPSS enough. You can't talk about the anatomy enough. You can't talk about the procedure enough. And so even if you feel like you've talked to these patients before, oh, I've, I've talked to them a hundred times about the procedure. I have patients I've talked to a hundred times and, and on that hundredth time, they're like, okay, I'm ready, you know? And yeah. It's, you, so are you, you using... You said education, You're talking to, so everybody learns differently. Some people like to see, some people like to read, mm -hmm. some people like somebody else to explain it to them. And we have all the modalities. I can obviously explain it to the patient. And are you using models in that first visit when they first yeah. come in? Are you using yeah. models to show them instead of the meet Mike video? We are. Okay. We are. Yeah, we are. 
Yeah, it's, it, yeah, like you said, you can do it however you want. You use models. I like to have the patient look at the video instead of looking their uh, look, watching or playing on their phone while they're waiting, right? Right. So, exactly. Exactly. And often when I, I typically do not keep my patients waiting for long at all. So often if I hear the video playing behind the door, I will step away, maybe do docu perform documentation on, on a previous patient and then come back. And by the time I walk in, the IPS is already done. I already have the Euroflow information. I've already reviewed their history and they've already reviewed the meet my video. So they, they have an understanding of where's the prostate, what is the prostate and what are some, some of the causes of, of my urinary difficulty, <coughs> excuse me, my urinary difficulties and, and that Eurolift is one of the many treatment options available. Yeah. And, and, and like we said, I think as long as you're, you have those tools, you're utilizing the tools, you know, because your rep, your rep can drop all those tools off and they can sit there in a corner in the office, you know, and that, that's really essentially what was going on in our office was we had all the tools. We just didn't, we, we just weren't utilizing them. And, and, and I think an easy cop out is to say, Oh, I just don't have the patience. It's like, you know, it, unless you're in a super niched urology field, you absolutely do have the patients. They are there every single day. I think we've and established, so I think we've established that. It's just <laughs> whether or not you are willing to face the music and actually take the, the very, very slight change in your workflow to identify yeah. these patients and cure these patients instead of putting a Band-Aid yeah. and possibly inducing further bladder damage from chronic obstructive voiding. And that's what, that's what I see. We'll, we'll talk about that a, a little yeah. bit later. So, so, yeah. so now we've, we've gotten the initial patient in the office, done the Euroflow, done the IPSS, uh, your docs done the examination and, um, the patient seems, okay. So, uh, Karen asks, what do you say to patients who have been on Flomax and finasteride for years or decades and are hesitant to get cystoscopy and transrectal ultrasound for evaluation? What, how do you address that issue? We have tons of those patients <laughs> because remember, we have just recently started making these cha big changes that were the past year. So we, we still have tons of those patients that are coming in for their annual visit. And, and I just, Again, I use their IPSS. I say, okay, so you are on Flomax, you are on finasteride, but look, your IPSS is a 20. So these medications are not maybe doing what they used to do for you before. And let's sit down and talk about what's going on behind the scenes in your bladder, in the muscle. Here's your bladder. Here's the muscle. Here's your prostate, the donut that sits around your urethra. This is the tube where your urine comes out. Your prostate's plugging things up. Your bladder muscle's working harder. It's having to squeeze harder to get past that big prostate. And, and maybe those medications were good for you for a, for a short period of time or a long period of time. But now we're kind of at the point where I think it, we need to get a baseline ultrasound to see exactly the size and shape of your prostate, to take a look at your bladder muscle. Let's just get a baseline. And that's usually what I'll, I'll say to patients is let's just get a baseline to kind of see where we're at. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll do those tests and maybe you can stay on those medications. But I think that you're going to be surprised to know that maybe there's more going on than, than really what we're able to assess on a rectal exam. I, um, I draw an analogy to people who sell things or, or for instance, your urology consultant or any medical device or drug salesperson, if they don't believe in the drug or device, they will never sell anything to you. Fortunately in urology, we don't have to sell anything to any patient we are simply offering solutions. However, if the urologist is uncomfortable with performing cystoscopies or transrectal ultrasounds, whether philosophically or technically, less likely technically, but more philosophically because they're so used to just refilling medications, right? In two, 2018 AUA's uh, BPH guideline now suggests imaging such as transrectal ultrasound and cystoscopy to work up the BPH patient. So maybe they haven't read the updated BPH guidelines because we're, like you said, change is difficult for your front desk. Yep. Change is yep. difficult for everybody. And urologists are humans. We are so used to doing things the way we've always done them. And it's always difficult to make that change. So we are always resistant to change, no matter who the rep is, whatever the technology is. And often it is important to do a self-check. Are we having some sort of a bias, like status quo bias, right? 
a lot of us have status quo biases. And I always preach dogma, always challenge dogma, always think about, is there a w better way to do whatever I am doing? Otherwise, you're just going to be stagnant and your practice will be just like every other practice right. in in, right. The, in the mud and with uh, declining revenue and increasing overhead. Right. Yeah, you, ha you have to be willing to change. And, and I think you brought up a good point early on and in, in that these changes are not going to happen overnight. You're not going to you're not going to send people for trust to stow and have like 50 euro lifts next month. It's going to be a gradual steady incline, but that's also good for your staff in that, that it teaches them very slowly and easily on how things are going to change and how things are going to, are going to be taking place and how patients are going to be following up. And so um, you have to be under willing to not only make the change, but willing to be patient because those changes are not going to, it's nothing that's going to happen overnight. It took us a year and we're just kind of cracking the surface as to what we can do in our office. And so you have to be willing to, to be patient with that change. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, circle back on and talk about what do you say to the patients who are on Flomax and, and temps and uh, finasteride or five ARIs? What do you tell them? Why should they undergo cystoscopy and transfer ultrasound? Like you said, it is important to educate the patients about why we need to visualize the obstruction because it could be something other than BPH, right? Why are their right. symptom scores still so high despite on chronic combination pharmacologic therapy or worse yet, maximum pharmacologic therapy? And the patient's telling you with a very low bother score, even though their IPS is super high. So it's... First, you have to get the IPSS. I mean, that's just a given. And then you have to ask the patient, well, what? why is there such a, a, a big discrepancy? And all urologists know that there's very, very poor correlation between what the prostate felt like on the digital rectal examination and the degree of obstruction. And also the degree of obstruction on cystoscopy has very co poor correlation with the patient's IPSS. That's why it's important to look at the look at patient's anatomy objectively, not just with the rectal examination, not just with what the patient tells you. You want to correlate everything together. It could be a bladder stone. So it could be a bladder tumor right. that's causing these urinary right. symptoms. So I think it's crazy that a gastroenterologist will not even talk to you until he or she's done a colonoscopy or a sigmoidoscopy or upper GI, upper endoscopy, and, and ENTs will not do anything until they've looked into a, a, your nose or your ears with a nasopharyngoscope, right? And yet urologists, so many urologists are still practicing in the dark ages, assuming, yeah. assuming BPH without doing any sort of imaging or cystoscopy. That is just, in 2020, that's just crazy to me. Well, and I think you have to remember is that primaries are sending their patients to you. If they're, if you're getting a referral from a primary, they're sending these patients to you because they want you to do something that they're not going to be able to do. And so don't be afraid to, to do a cystoscopy or tell a patient that they need to trust because that's why they're sending them to you. And if you're, if you're just going to refill a medication or you're just going to tell them, Oh, just keep doing what your primary said. Well, then th you're, you're going to lose that source of referrals. Okay. Another, another thing that a lot of urologists are, I think, hesitant in doing, uh, well, another dogma, if you will, and I've talked about this before in the thriving urology practice, a lot, another dogma is that the, the use of viscous lidocaine, and I'm going to challenge the, the urologists who are watching this, this video. I have not used viscous lidocaine on my flexible cystoscopies in the office for years, and we're talking thousands of cystoscopies for male and female. If you are good enough with the scope. If you are good enough with your verbal skills, patients, I would say 99.999% of patients do great without viscous lidocaine. The discomfort of not doing a, a, a cystoscopy without lidocaine is with the urologist, not with the patient. So whether you are comfortable enough in performing cystoscopies in the office, flexible cystos, for males and females without viscous lidocaine, that's on you, urologist. That's not on the patients. I'll just let you let you chew on that for a second. Thousands of cystoscopies over years. All right. So anyway, cystoscopy is a no-brainer. 
I mean, there's there's so many benefits to looking in, into the patient's bladder. All other special, specialties do it. Why are urologists so behind the times? It just freaking boggles my mind. And transrectal ultrasound is so so small. I tell the patients when I'm doing the transrectal ultrasound that it's smaller than the poop that's come out of there. So chill <laughs> out. It's cool. <laughs> it's true. It's so true. Yeah, and, 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 yeah. and I will tell you that my patients, they don't even flinch when I do the transrectal ultrasound. Well, and I think that goes back to our last conversation. Of, if your patient's nervous about these procedures, and some of them are, and maybe that's the barrier to not getting your patients to procedure, then maybe you need some nitrous in the office to make them more comfortable. There we go. I mean, you know, that you, you got to find, if you want to make the changes and you're, you're worried about X, Y, and Z, then sometimes you got to make some other changes in your practice in order to get patients to those procedures. I know for us, we do plenty of prostate uh, ultrasounds and cystos with, with nitrous because patients are like, ah, I'm scared. And, you know, it, the nitrous, it just makes things so much smoother, even for the urolifts themselves too. So sometimes you gotta, you gotta be willing to, to make those, those changes. And it's not just going to be one single change. You're not just going to add the IPSS form to the front desk or, or to your MAs you know, list of things to do. It's going to be, okay, well, I know I'm going to get be getting more procedures. I'm going to have to be able to do the cystose trusses. I'm going to have to be able to offer some anxiolytic to get patients that are fearful. I'm going to have to, you're going to have to, you know, in a methodical fashion, kind of think about what other changes are going to come with increasing your patient volume. You have to be able to, you know, that's a whole nother, a whole nother uh, conversation, but All you right. have to be. <laughs> so, so let's, let's, let's talk. So for those who are wondering what, about what Stephanie's talking about, we did a zoom interview meeting about nitrous oxide. We talked about Pronox and Nitronox. Stephanie uses both in her office. I use Pronox in my office. You can look for it uh, in the timeline on the Facebook page or it's also on YouTube, so you can Google or Google the, uh, or you can search for it on YouTube, and that video is out there. You can, I don't know, Pronox, or you can type in my name and, and Pronox or Stephanie's name, and it'll pop up, and, and nitrous oxide. So look for that video. When it comes to, I, I really think that when it comes to patient acceptance, and, and I'm married to a dentist, and I get the, uh, the dental rags, they are, okay, if, if you are married to a dentist, he or she may be, <laughs> may be a little mad because they sell, they sell their stuff. They sell that for that smile because a lot of it is, you know, a lot of what they do is elective. So they do a lot of selling. We fortunately do not need to do any selling, but I learn a lot from reading the, the rags and also attend sometimes the regional dental conventions. And I learn about marketing and stuff like that from those meetings. If the physician is not comfortable in doing cystoscopies or transrectal ultrasounds, it will show in your demeanor. The patient's gonna be able to pick up that discomfort. However, if you truly believe in what you are doing, the patients will fully accept and adopt what you are telling them. So I will just share that with you based on my experience. And Stephanie, what do you think? I, I agree with you completely. And I'm married to a, a high rise concrete <laughs> construction guy. So I can't, I can't really speak to uh, marketing, but uh, from his perspective, but I would say you, you really have to be comfortable with it. And if you just walk in there and you have the conversation and, and the patient says that you're relaxed, you know what you're talking about. You've done this a thousand times, then they're, they're there because they want help. They want to be sitting in your waiting room and, and, and coming to the urologist and taking off work and, and doing all those things if they don't want to be helped. And so I think sometimes urology practices are also like, oh, well, maybe my patient doesn't want a procedure. or Maybe they're not ready or don't make that decision for them. That's a great segue because uh, Dr. Pullman said, those who are hesitant to proceed with cysto and transrectal, transrectal ultrasound or further workup in anticipation of the urolift system or TURP or some other procedure to cure them, then the patient can go back to their PCP to refill their meds and then follow up with urology as needed. And he is yeah. just, he, that's exactly the way I do it. And it shocks the patient sometimes because they'll come yeah. in, they'll come in and they'll be on medication and I'll tell them, okay, well, if you're going to stay on medication and you don't, you don't want to work up, then I'm going to send you back to your primary care doctor because 
I do not need to continue to see you. And they're shocked. The guys are shocked. Wait, what do you mean? I thought all doctors are so greedy. They just want to keep, keep the patients coming back so they can get that recurring revenue. No, there are so <laughs> many BPH patients that there are not, there are literally not enough urologists in the US to take care of just BPH patients. 12 million under treatment on medical therapy, 40 million total addressable market in the US. Are you kidding me? There are only about 10,000 urologists. We don't have enough urologists. Anyway, off, off the uh, <laughs> off rant. Okay. So now the patient has seen the doctor, answered IPSS, and now you talk to the patient. Okay, it's important to figure out your anatomy. Then you schedule the patient for cystoscopy and transrectal ultrasound. So tell us, walk us through what happens on that day. Uh, you kind of mentioned that you perform the procedure and then afterwards you have the family come and watch the Meet Mike video. Anything else? Right. So we, we do actually have a, um, I know this is a little different from your practice, but we do actually have a, a tech that's just strictly doing prostate ultrasounds. We have a room, the patient comes in, they get their trust, then they get moved, then they literally walk next door, get their cystoscopy. Um, and so Mark is doing the cystoscopy. Mark comes out of the room. Mark tells me what procedure he thinks they're good for. Hey, Steph, this is a good fit for a Euro lift. So the patient, then we have, go in there. We have the patient get dressed, have go get their family member out of the waiting room, have them watch the video. Then we go over the uh, educational brochures, give them some stuff to take home for those da daughters, sons, whoever is going to be asking all the questions and get them scheduled as they leave. So it's really a machine. You know, they come in and then when then we have the next one, trust the stove, Steph goes in, trust the stove, Steph, Steph goes in. And so um, it's it's really it's that's it's it's more like an efficient workflow. That's what you're trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's a, it's an efficient workflow. Now, before it was kind of like you know a circus because you've got so many patients. You, if, if you're ready for all these patients, you want all these procedures. Be ready because there's going to be you're going to go from doing five trust systems in one day to you know thirty that we did the other day. And yeah. so it's you got to be ready to handle that. And so we we've really perfected that instead of Mark wasting. I don't want to say wasting his time, but being inefficient, he needs to do he, he needs to do what he's good at as a physician. And so from my perspective, I can go in there and I can have that conversation and take that extra time to go over that procedure, make sure the patient gets scheduled. Um, and, and then at that point, the patient's like, OK, like I've seen all the evidence as to why I need to do something about this. That's 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 really neat. Uh, my workflow is just slightly different than yours. I have the, so after I see the patient, the patient wishes to undergo additional workup. Actually, let me go back a little bit. At that first encounter, that first treatment or visit, I will ask the patient who those who want to stay on medication or, or when we talk about treatment options, I'll tell the patient, ask the patient, are you the kind of person who likes to put a band aid on the problem or do you want a cure? So if you want to stay on medication, I call that a band aid. And then if you if you want a cure, then let's talk about other treatment options, TURP, laser, plasma, what, Urolift, whatever it is that your urologists do. And if they are interested in, under, in undergoing further evaluation or they want to know the, the cause or they are thinking about a cure, then I will schedule the patient for cystoscopy and transrectal ultrasound. As soon as the patient walks out to the front desk, the checkout person will schedule the patient for cystoscopy and transrectal ultrasound done on the same day. Then the patient returns on a separate day, so we have everything sterilized, ready to go. Goes into the procedure room. My medical assistant takes the patient to the procedure room. The patient is supine, and the medical assistant preps the patient for cystoscopy. I literally walk in, say hello to the patient, and then perform the cystoscopy because the MA hands me the scope, and I look in real quick. This is something else that I do, and I think you do the same thing. I have two monitors when I perform cystoscopies. One is right in front of me and the other is at the foot of the bed so the patient can look at that monitor. As I'm doing the procedure, I will narrate to the patient for those who want to actually watch it. And most patient, most men do actually. And, they, and I'll say, okay, you'll feel a little bit of pressure as we go through the external sphincter and all that stuff. And, um, and then I go through the, as I go through the prostate, I'll tell the patient, okay, this is, you see the pink things coming in from the sides and you see that little slit in the middle, 
your pee is going through that little slit, and then the pink things are your prostate. And then I go further retrograde into the bladder, and that's where I show the patients, okay, here are the changes that happen in the bladder. These are not going to go away. They will never go back to their normal condition before th these things happen, the, the, the trabeculations, the cellules, the diverticuli. And you retroflex a scope, look at the bladder neck, see the amount, if there's any intravascular intrusion, note that it, if there's any uh, median lobe uh, intrusion and determine what is the best treatment option for the patient. On the way out, I'll say, okay, here's your bladder, last chance to look, here's your bladder. And on the way out, I'll say, okay, this is your bladder neck. And then you see the pink stuff coming in from the sides, that's your prostate. And right there, before I fully exit the prostate, I will turn the irrigation fluid off so they see what it looks like before I turn the fluid slightly back on and I'll show them, okay, this is normal and this is why you're peeing. There's almost, almost always, there's no opening. There's like a little slit in the middle and they, right. they fully get it. They see the damage done to the bladder. They see the obstruction and they fully, now they fully understand us talking about it, using models, using the, the meet Mike video. Now they fully get what's going on. And then I'll, and I will literally walk out of the room at that time. And my medical assistants are so awesome. I have a great staff. My medical assistant will say, okay, go to the bathroom, empty your bladder. And then while he is emptying the bladder she, or before she, she uh, puts the patient in the bathroom, which is attached to the procedure room, she'll ask, do you have a family member here with you today? And if there is, while he's voiding, she goes out to the front desk, brings the family member back into an, an into an exam room where the patient will then unite with the with the family and that is when this happens my medical assistant will hand the patient and family a frequently asked question sheet for urolif because during the cystoscopy i will tell i will tell my ma and she's done so many of these with me she knows whether or not the patient's a good urolif candidate and i'll tell her that hey this is a good urolif candidate she will then room the patient. The family will be in the, exam, in the exam room. She will hand them a frequently asked questions sheet on Eurolift that'll go over, is it covered by Medicare? Um, can I go through the metal detector at the airport? Is it gonna sound the alarm? Uh, is it MRI safe? Is it FDA cleared? So it's gonna answer all those questions. Um, how long does it last and, and all that stuff. So frequently asked question is handed to them while I'm documenting what I found on a cystoscopy and transrectal sound. And then by the time they're done, I'm done with the, the, the documentation for the procedure. I walk in a room and I ask, okay, you are a good candidate for the Euler system. Would that be a bad idea? Do you have any questions? And I, sometimes I'm meeting the, the spouse for the first time. So I, I introduce myself to the wife and we'll go from there. Yeah, so I, I think it's just a little bit different way of getting to the same endpoint. Just, you know, having the patients see on the cystoscopy the damage and seeing their enlarged prostate, you know, sometimes patients can be skeptical of things. And so if you're putting it right out there, what do they have to be skeptical about? I mean, you're, you're just really showing them the facts and making them a part of their, their care. And I think that patients really like that. They like, they like, being a part of their that decision making and just kind of going through the process and and not making them feel like um, you know that they that they don't know what's going on. Yeah, the days of the paternalistic physician telling dictating what mm -hmm. the patient needs to do is slowly going away. Nowadays, everything is all about shared decision making, offering the patients the various treatment options, and then of course you can always recommend what you think based on your experience as a practitioner the best treatment option for the patient and then guide the patient that way. And if the patient's not ready, they can, they can get further education. There's tons of videos and information about the various BPH treatment options. And I, and I think it's important that, you know, I would say maybe one in 10 of our trust systems is kind of a little bit hesitant about booking an actual procedure. Have that patient come back in a month, have that patient come back in two months, you know, revisit with that patient just because there just no does not mean no it means no not right now and so that's like a philosophy that I live by is that you know I can think of how many times I said no to something and then 
you know, by the fifth or sixth time, I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, I'm ready. And so no doesn't mean no. It's no, not right now. Have that patient follow up in a couple months, revisit that idea, talk about it, and and, and don't ever just push that patient like, oh, well, I'm just going to keep refilling their medications because it's just, they're just may not re- be ready. Okay. And on a, on a, on a coding and billing perspective, having just returned from the urology advanced coding and reimbursement seminar, we've been teaching this for a while. When you perform when practices or urologists perform cystoscopy, transrectal ultrasound, and now sit the patient down for an ENM visit, you can bill for the ENM cystoscopy and transrectal ultrasound all done on the same day if Medicare is the payer. Your private payers will obviously be different, but you can and you should be paid for all three things, provided that you use the appropriate modifier 25 and you prov- you provide the, the distinct and separately identifiable problem and documentation. So ideally, we, we talked about it this weekend. Ideally, you should have an ENM visit documentation and a cystoscopy transrectal ultrasound do- documentation. Ideally, doesn't have to be, but ideally, you should have that. Also, some billers, coders, offices, hospital systems may be uh, misinformed or simply are ignorant that you do not need a different diagnosis. You do not need a different diagnosis to bill an ENM visit with the Modern Fire 25 and be paid for all three. And lastly, you do not take a 50% multiple procedure reduction on your transrectal ultrasound. So that's a lot of nuggets for you. Hopefully that's helpful. All right, so now the patient has gone through cystoscopy and transrectal ultrasound, decided to have a Urolift. What do you What do you guys do at that time? So after they've watched the video, they, they've got the brochure, I've answered their questions. We have them schedule. We have them schedule at the front desk uh, for the procedure. And then we also do have a little chat about nitrous, if they're going to want to be doing the procedure with or without nitrous. Um, and then they leave with an appointment that day with a, a little uh, a little sheet that kind of goes over what's going to happen that day. Yes, we want you to eat. No, you don't need to be MPO. What kind of medications we don't want you to take. Um, and, and then they come in for their procedure. Now, we do have uh, one of our office staff that does all of the prior offs and that kind of thing. And, and we always make sure that we fo- follow up with our patients, you know, a couple of days before, Hey, we know you're scheduled for this procedure on Friday or whatever day. Um, how are you feeling? You have any questions? You know, just to, just to make sure tie up any loose ends because the last thing you want is to have gotten the patient this far and then they freak out. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them do. <laughs> So it's just good to stay in touch with those patients, you know, ha- make a phone call. We, we, we send automated text messages just like, hey, you know, you know we're going to be seeing you in a couple of days. Um, and, and and really, it's that seamless for, I would say, most patients. You're going to have your hiccups along the way. Uh, you're going to have your things that you need to finesse and smooth out. But you just you just have to take it one day at a time when you're making these kind of changes and and. And, and really, it can be quite smooth and seamless. I think once you figure out the plan, the workflow, and implement it, and then go keep going back in, in an iterative manner and find out what has worked and what do you need to tweak, it eventually works out perfectly. And what you said before, very at the very beginning, is that you saw you actually went somewhere and watched another practice or, or observed another practice on how they work the patient through and how they perform the Eurolex system procedure. And you said that was really helpful. I, I've i told everybody at Neotract, including the CEO last week when I met with him for a, a breakfast meeting uh, last week, I said, I don't know if you need to know this, but you do need to know this. <laughs> um, that preceptorship training that you guys offer is pivotal. And, and for any physician that's watching this, the best thing you could do for your practice, even if you are, let's say, doing 10 euro lifts a month, go on, take the one, take the overnight to to, to go and watch another practice like Dr. Lynn. Um, you can come to our practice out in the Midwest. 
take that overnight, go and see how that practice functions and the flow because your rep and, and you can hear that from us all day long, but until you see it in, in really in live real life, you, you can't put all those pieces together. It's kind of hard to it, grasp. I know, I know, I know just talking about this and we're kind of bouncing back and forth and I'm hoping people can get it, but once you see it, and I don't know what it is. Physicians don't believe uh, reps, nurses, NPs. They seem to only want to hear from physicians, or especially right. physicians in their same field. It, and uh, and and I totally get it. You know, we we are. It, it's a very um, you know we're we're slow to change, and we are distrustful of salespeople. So I totally get it. But it almost always takes, you know, the office manager won't work, the biller won't work, the coder won't work. They want to talk to another physician, and then like, oh, okay, I see. And then the coder and biller and office manager is like, we've been telling you the same thing for years. Why, <laughs> why, why, why do you finally get it now? And it takes another physician. I, I that's just the way it is. It just, it's kind of frustrating in trying to effect a more efficient change in practices. But unfortunately, that's the way it is. And I completely agree with you that visiting another practice and watching how they do things. And then it could be things other than BPH management, Eurolift workflow. It could be other things that that particular practice does that you don't do. And it could be just totally mind blowing. And, and, and Neo Tract is covering this. I mean, you know, so I, I hear from so many physicians, oh, I, I don't want to like take a clinic day off to go but if you're doing one year lift a month, maybe taking that clinic day is really going to be worth it in the long run for you to go and see how another practice is functioning. Because clearly, you know, those those practices that are doing one year lift a month, you're, you're not doing all the things if you're doing one year lift a month. And so you really, it, it, even us doing 25 year lifts a month, I'm going out and seeing you in, in a couple of weeks. It's, because uh, you're never going to, you're never going to know I, there's never a perfect situation. And so I may have different objectives than somebody else who's watching this video. And that's okay. You're that that's the whole idea is that you don't have to have the same objectives. You can have different objectives. Go to these preceptorships, take the time, utilize the resources. That's what your reps are there for. Neotract offers this amazing opportunity. Take advantage of it. I, I have to say that the uh uh, Neotract is such an exemplary company when it comes to uh, the uh, the Eurolift system. The way they got through the FDA clearance, the fact that they got uh, their uh, Category oh. One co CPT codes, um, how they are, how they started uh, training urologists. They followed Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rule. They went deep instead of wide. They ensured that patients have good outcomes instead of just hang, having mass adoption. And uh, I congratulate Teleflex for acquiring them a couple of years ago for, uh, you know, it's amazing that a single medical device company was acquired for $1.1 billion. So that goes to the strength of the, of the technology and the company and the uh, support. And I don't know about you, but my Neotrack reps have been freaking phenomenal. And I've flown across the country to, to help other urology practices adopt uh, uh, Eurolift. And all the reps that I've met, uh, they are- if, They're amazing. They, they, they They're... are just, yeah, the way they, I don't know how they hired these people. Maybe they, maybe they quickly eliminate all the bad ones, but all the ones that, are, <laughs> that, that I've met, and then we're talking, you know, I was in Chicago and I was in, in St. Louis and California and, and Arizona multiple different locations and other practices have flown here and i met all those reps from all different parts of the country they are just amazing so practices that are thinking about you doing urolift or have an existing urolift urology consultant they're called ucs or urology consultants utilize them they are freaking amazing they can help improve your practice and keep in mind They'll, they'll help you with their marketing and stuff like that. Keep in mind, this could be the procedure. And once you become successful in doing this procedure, you can take this exact same model and implement whatever future procedures that you want to do and follow this playbook. It's tried and true. It's proven. So think about doing that. Absolutely.
Well, I know I'm seeing you and Mark next month. Is that right? Yeah, Mar in March, beginning of March. Great. So you can get out of the uh, cold. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, I Can't don't. Wait. I don't think I have any other uh, questions. Uh, but uh, if you uh, if you're watching this on a replay, feel free to uh, leave questions in the comment section. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, please uh, leave comments, and uh, and uh, I will do my best to try to guide you to the correct uh, answer. Or uh, if there's something that I can answer myself, I will do the best that I can. So lastly, I want to thank you uh, so much, Stephanie, for sharing your insights on how to. Uh, effectively convert patients, BPH patients, into uh, surgical candidates. I mean, these patients need help. And um, I'm really grateful that you are taking time on a, on a Sunday, Sunday evening to do this for everybody. Great to be here. See you in a couple of weeks. All right. Okay, you guys, if you have any questions, again, leave them in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. And those of you who are watching this and are not members of the Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group, please find us and join us in the fun and frivolity. Uh, we, the, the goal of the group is that we crowdsource practice management solutions for your benefit. Have a good night. Bye-bye.